In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, it says this. It says, For through Jesus we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Through Jesus we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. We see right there at the top of the message this reality that God is the, 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 the Trinity reality. Uh, the Trinity is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament, but the principle of God being three distinct persons, yet one God is, is written throughout all of the New Testament. We see through Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. We actually sang that today. Justin and I um, worked even, even more closely than usual trying to prepare that set of songs. You might not have noticed it, but we started that set with how great is our God, recognizing that we indeed have a great God. And, and then Justin and the team transitioned to your good, good father, that we see that there's a, a relationship we have with God the Father. You're perfect in all of your ways. We relate to God as God the Father in our lives. You're, it's, it's who you are. We know that to be true. And then we transition to Christ is enough. We sang a, a verse and a chorus and a bridge of Christ is enough. And then I saw many hands lifted in the air saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. We're engaging God through the Son, Jesus, through God the Father and through the Son, Jesus. And then, of course, we just finished the set with Holy Spirit. You're welcome here. And, and that, that's the one that we, we need to live in the presence of God's Spirit, aware of the presence of God's Spirit in our lives every day. The Spirit of God is what gives us access to God 24-7. In fact, Jesus, he, he said, and it's, it's mind-blowing because we, we connect with God so much through the story of Jesus, but Jesus himself said to the disciples, he said, look, in this skin suit that I'm wearing, Jesus said, I can only be in one place at a time because I am fully man. So I know you've enjoyed my presence and you've learned a lot, but Jesus said, it's going to be a really good thing for you when I go because then I'm going to send a comforter, a guide that will be with you all the time, teaching you and reminding you of all the things that I've taught you. We need the Spirit of God. So we, we have an awareness of God's tr three in one presence, his three in one persons, yet he is one God. I thought this morning that I was going to be unpacking uh, the Trinity and, and giving you tools to articulate and understand the reality of the Trinity. I did a lot of work just digging into the three in one, per, like what's the Bible have to say about God that in three in one, and, and God just took my message a different direction. And I've been trying to keep up with what he's been doing all week long. And so I do have some really great uh, tools in my toolbox from this week understanding the Trinity, but that's not what I'm going to share today, though I'll say it again. You can always take me and my wife out for a steak dinner, and I'll tell you everything I learned. But today, I don't get the luxury of, of giving that information to you. I want to kind of do what we did last week. We're in a series called Jesus in 3D, like seeing Jesus differently, engaging with Jesus differently. And, and last week, we talked about Jesus, the dominion of Jesus, that he's the king. And what I knew last week that God reminded me of this week is that it's one thing to know he's king. If you weren't here, uh, you missed it. But those that were here, you saw that we, we put like a, a video of a, of a roller coaster on the screen that's just like that you can find on YouTube. And you could see the entire roller coaster on that YouTube video. And so we could say that we've ridden the roller coaster because we at least saw the roller coaster. We experienced the roller coaster. And then we watched the video of, of uh, Kevin Hart and Jimmy Fallon. And that was hilarious. And Kevin Hart's faces were amazing. And, and then he got a bug in the eye for Jimmy Fallon. And we realized there's, you can have seen the, 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 the roller coaster on a video clip, but there's nothing like writing it. The expressions that you make, the experiences that you have. And, and a place like this, a place like this is a concentrated room for us to see that he's king, to see that he's good, to see all of these things, because we see it in the lives of other people. But what God put on my heart for last week was not just to say he is king, but to say, is he your king? And in the same way, I want to talk about the, the, the deity of Jesus today. Last week's the dominion of Jesus, and this week's the deity of Jesus, which is to say that Jesus is God, that he is, in fact, 
God. In fact, Romans says it like this. The spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives within you. Another translation says the power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of me and you. So I I want to do two things. I want to show out of God's word that, that Jesus is, in fact, God. But way more important is what does that mean for our lives, the deity of Jesus? And in Colossians chapter 1, we see this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So we're already right off the bat, we're seeing a God that... That is spirit. John chapter 4 says, for God is spirit. So those who worship him have to worship in spirit. Though we can't see, remember the Billy Graham, the real real popular Billy Graham quote, I can't see the wind. I see the effects of the wind, but I can't see the wind. And in the same way, God is a spirit. And so we see the things that he's done. And in the the Old Testament, whether it be like the sun standing still or a Red Seas parting, all the miracles that God did, they saw the effects of God, but they never saw God. And then Jesus, Jesus enters the scene, and now we see a visible expression of the invisible God. We'll jump down to verse 19. For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. That God, the power of that God, was somehow pleased to live in Christ. Every time I read this, I think of the scene in Aladdin where the genie's talking about like how great, how big that he is and all that he can accomplish, and he can do all of these things, and he goes, itty bitty living space. It's like, it's like Jesus, like God is this infinite God, incomprehensible, indescribable, inexhaustible. And he was content to live in a skin suit, the frame of a man. He was okay with that because he wanted to get to where we are. We keep reading in verse 20, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. It's not really my message for today, but when I read that, knowing that God was content and satisfied so that he could get to us to be in the person of Jesus Christ, in a man, he was content to be there. And then we see in Colossians, in verse 20 of that chapter, we see that, that what, G, what God did through Jesus on the cross reconciled everything. I found myself as I was reading this week, I found myself just thinking about like the God who is the creator. We'll look at that here in a little bit, that the Roman soldiers that were there, you know, God, God formed the saliva glands in the, inside of them that they were using to spit on the face of God. God, the Psalms say that the trees of the field clap their hands to a majestic God. They, they stand tall, and as the wind blows, they, they go back and forth, and they're clapping their hands to a majestic God. No, the trees know who their creator is, and they respond to that creator with worship and praise. And somehow, men took down one of those trees and, and turned it into a cross, and, and they put God, the creator of the trees, on the cross. That God is, was pleased to just come in the form of a man. And Jesus became the very nature and the force of God. J. Oswald Sanders, I I like this this quote. He says this, If Jesus is not God, then there is no Christianity. And we who worship him are nothing more than idolaters. Conversely, if he is God, those who say he was merely a good man or even the best of men are blasphemers. More serious still, if he is not God, then he is a blasphemer in the fullest sense of the word. If he's not God, then he is not even good. Like, I got to thinking about the power that has afforded us. The Romans says it's the very power of God that has raised Christ from the dead, and it's given to us. Imagine, if you will, you know, we're like, or I'm getting, getting gas, and we're at a gas station, and you and the corner of the gas station is this this tent that's set up, and this there's a sign, and the guy's at the at the at this tent, and he's saying, "Hey, look, look! If you put this gas in your car, your car is going to run completely different." Talk about power and torque! Like if you put this, he's got ten gallon uh, bu- like cans of this gasoline, and he says, "You put this in your car, like you got any leaks? It's going to fix the leaks. It's going to give you power and torque and fuel economy like you've never experienced. All you got to do is put this power." 
power, this, this power in a can in your car, and then you will have access to power like you've never imagined the next time you fire up your car. And so I'm like, I'll take that. How much is it? It's free. We want everybody's car to run as good as they possibly can. I'll take that. So I take it and I put it in my car and I'm driving down the road and my car is still running like crap. Like, uh, it's still leaking and, and it, it, like, like, like I have a, my van out there um, that my wife finally rode, rode in for the first time. I was so thankful for that, but it leaks stuff and, and it, it, it gets horrible gas mileage. And I, th- I, put, I thought that I could put this in there and it would change it. And so I go back to the guy that's at the tent and imagine if you will, I go to this guy and I'm like, dude, you lied to me. I thought that this was going to help my car situation. I thought my wife might actually like my van. And, and so then he says, well, come on over. Let me show you. Let me show you. Let me take a look. And I open the back of the van and there's the can in the back of the van. And I put it in the van. I just, I, I didn't put it in, 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 in the fuel part of the van, you know? So what I, I wonder, I wonder why it is that you and I live the kinds of lives that are powerless. We have access to it. The very power that raised Christ from the dead is given to us. But the, there's a difference, though, in having access to the power and putting it in the closet of our heart somewhere. And maybe one day, we wouldn't, if we need it, we'll use it. And, and actually getting it inside of us and it being in our, in our heart and coming out of our mouth and in our attitudes and in our actions and in our emotions. Like the power of God that has been given to us is available. And sometimes, and I'm just speaking to me, you got to know, this is one of those messages that I, I went to my office even yesterday before me and my wife went and had a day at, the, at Lake Comanche sitting at the beach. I, could, I had to go work on my message again yesterday because I've been preaching this to myself all week. So this is the kind of message that I preached to me all six days of last week. And now I'm just sharing with you what God is saying to me. And what I know to be true about my life is why do I live powerless sometimes if the very power that raised Christ from the dead has been given to me? That was afforded to us in the person of Jesus. The Bible, this is an interesting thought. You might disagree with it, but it's an interesting thought that I found myself kind of living with this week. I believe the Bible can be boiled down into three, three words. That the Bible actually, cover to cover, all 66 books of this Bible, that, this, that there, it, it can be boiled down, the thesis of this book can be boiled down into three words. I believe that, and I've just spent a lot of time this week getting to the heart of that, and I believe what the Bible can be boiled down into three words is these three words, God with us. That's the point. That God, I mean, if we think about it, God, he made us. He wanted to get to us through creation, and then sin broke it down. And the creator, the designer, made this thing, and sin was a virus that destroyed it. And, and ever since then, God's, he's been trying to get to his people, right? He, he's talking through prophets, telling the people of God, like, you need to come back to me. I'll relent on my anger. I'll, I'll take you back. And so we read, and the, the law is given, which helps us have an understanding of what God expects and requires from us. And so we do these rituals and, and the Old Testament sacrifices so that we can have connection with God again. Ultimately, God says, well, this will never work. And so he sends the Jesus Christ, and Jesus comes as the Passover lamb once and for all. No more sacrifices now that there's Jesus. Through Jesus, we have access to the Father. And then Jesus tells us, he says, I got to go back to heaven, but I'm going to leave the Spirit of God with you all the time. Time. And then the rest of the Bible is how do we live in this spirit that has been given to us, that, that God's plan has been to be with us. That's why he gave us this book. Do we live? Do we live? Do I live? I, I feel like I should have a mirror right here and you guys can just be behind me. Dustin Burke, do you live like you have that power in your life? In Galatians, and this is one of the reasons I, I decided to, I just I might not. I, I'm going to try to stay seated, but I'm a pretty excitable guy, so I don't know. So if I if I get up a bunch and it's starting to get a little excited, just go, yo, just do one. Give me this hand motion, like just relax, Dustin, okay? Because I want to I want to do a little more teaching today and, and maybe articulate some of the things that I learned that I found. I found in the book of Galatia, Galatians, as, as Paul's talking to the church in Galatia, something to help me illustrate this graphic. So, so this, this graphic is more than just a really pretty visual. Go ahead and kill the lights for me real quick. I want to really see this, this visual. So, so this is more than just a, a really pretty thing. This is, 
the, I, that conference that I was at last week, I, they, they explained this. You might have seen it. It's not a new thing. It's been out for quite a while. But this graphic is basically every single arc that's represented there. And I should have found a higher res photo. It's not a great photo. But every single arc that's represented there is, is a cross-reference from one part in the Bible to another part of the Bible. See, this is why I said that I, I believe that the Bible is this, a theme that's been written all across. So you see, you see a little arc. It's like God said something here and then maybe a prophet or maybe someone else came and, and referenced what was said back there. We see references all the way from Genesis all the way over to Revelation. And we see prophets of old being revisited in the New Testament. There's over 65,000 cross-references that's on that, that, that screen right there. 65,000 cross-references. Oh my gosh. See, you know, no one did this. If you did this to me, I wouldn't have done that. So, so I need your help, guys. I mean, that was a, t- a test, and you all failed miserably, but now I'm scared. I, I knew I was going to do that at one point. So, so 65,000 cross-references that are referenced there, which is to say that the Bible is not a collection of sh- short stories or short books. It's this thing that keeps getting reiterated over and over and over and over again. That Basically, God is saying, I really want what I made to be back in its original design. And we see over and over and over again where, where God's men and women are reiterating this thing. This is a powerful reminder that when you open up this book, like just anywhere you read, anywhere you read is going to tell you a glimpse into God's heart to get to you. And I, I, I wonder if today, I'm going to do a little bit of teaching, but, but the point of it, I'm going to set up an introduction so that in the last couple minutes, we can maybe just make a decision about what does the power mean in our lives? Maybe there's going to be some lines in the sand that will be drawn today. Maybe there'll be some mindsets that will shift to, and, and some adjustments that will be made in the way that we live our lives. That, that maybe the power of God is, to, is meant to come out of our mouths in the way we talk to others. It's meant to come out of our mouths and the way we engage our kids and our, our spouse. It's, it's meant to, to be a part of our workplace. And the spirit of God is, is given to us so that we have power and authority, not that we just stick it somewhere in the closet of our heart. But maybe today the prayer is, I want your power to be just in every, every fiber of who I am. And in Galatians, Paul illustrates this in a really, really cool way. And this, to give you some context for the church in Galatia, so this is, this is an interesting church in Galatia. So there, there, it has a lot of Gentiles in it. And then there's also quite a few Jews that have come from Jerusalem. And Paul is actually pretty frustrated now. If you read this passage, if you read Galatians, you'll see that there's a tone about Paul that he's just frustrated. In one, one place, he says, in essence, he says, like, are you guys like possessed? And he's frustrated and he thinks that they've lost complete handle on what Jesus came to do. And he, he, he's saying this, what I'm about to read to you, because the Jews have come in to this Galatian church and they're not opposed to the Gentiles now being able to come to church. They just want the, the Gentiles to have to do church the way that they think that it should be done. Like you got to follow the, the Torah. You got to be circumcised. And you got to only eat this and not eat this. And and so Paul, we're picking up where Paul's speaking directly to the Jews after the Jews are giving the Gentiles a hard time telling them how they should live. And this passage of scripture, I hope to make sense of maybe, maybe what was at the heart of the Jews as Paul was writing to them. In, in verse 5, and you also see that graph that I drew, just how many times that Paul references an Old Testament passage. In verse 5, I ask you again. Does God give you the Holy Spirit? There's one of the Godhead. And work miracles among you because you obey the law. Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. And in the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. That's a cross reference from Genesis 15, 6, quoting in verse 7. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. 
What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago. So we're going to see where God made a message a long time ago, and and Paul's going to reiterate it when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. That's a reference from Genesis 12, Genesis 18, Genesis 22. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing that Abraham received because of his faith. So God did one thing in Abraham's... uh, day. Now through Christ, he's offering the same blessing because he's the same God. And now he's doing, uh, launched a new plan. And verse 10, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all of the commands that are written in God's book of the law. That's a direct reference from Deuteronomy all the way here to Galatians. Verse 11, so it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For scriptures say it's through faith that a righteous person has life. That's a reference from Habakkuk chapter 2. This way of life is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. That's pulled from Leviticus chapter 18. But Christ has rescued us. Thank God. That would have been a great place to amen. I know you weren't ready for it, but let me say it again. But Christ has rescued us. Amen. Rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. A reference from Deuteronomy chapter 21. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. The Bible is one story of God trying to get to us. And then the narrative changed where Back in the Old Testament, they only had access to the power of God certain times of the month and certain places when they gathered to do these certain things. And, and the Jews had become pretty, grown pretty accustomed to, they like knowing that God's not mad at them. See, listen, like, like Jesus, we know Jesus, he's a friend of sinners. Like the Jews would have been like, no, he is not a friend of sinners. He, he, when he couldn't find a righteous person in Sodom and Gomorrah, what'd he do? He is done. When, when God can't find righteous people, he is not a friend of them in the Old Testament there because he's a just God. He's a perfect God. He's a holy God, and he requires holiness and righteousness. And God is, he, he did not display himself as a friend of sinners. So the Jews, they, they grew accustomed to, I like knowing that I've got God on my side. They, they, we sang it. If God's for us, who can be against us? And, and so they like knowing that God is for them. And they do these things. And when they do these things, they have the confident assurance that God is with them. And that's what the story of God is all about. God is with them. So I, I, I ask myself, so Paul's frustrated trying to get these Jews to see that it's, we're no longer doing it that way. I ask myself, to, uh, like I have so many other times, and I mean, over the last couple of years, I've had a, a better pulse on it. But have you, anyone ever, you don't have to raise your hand, but this is, was always my thing, I, especially growing up from a young age in, in school, in, or in Sunday school, hearing these stories. It's like the Old Testament, you know, people couldn't keep up with it, and it just, it just didn't work. And I often wondered, like, I felt like it was like a failed experiment. Like, it was like, God, why didn't you just start with the Jesus thing? Because, like, there's a lot of years where people had a law and they just couldn't measure up to the law. And, you know, I know you're all knowing and omnipotent and, and everything. So, like, you knew that was going to happen. Why didn't you just start with Jesus? And then we could have avoided all the law stuff because now you and I are still trying to break away from the law that was given, living these religious lives that we think we're supposed to live like the Jews sometimes. So, why did you do it? Well, in the same passage we just read, jump a verse down. Why then was the law given? There it is. If you have a biblical question, we should just jump to the Bible, right? So why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to only last until the coming of the child who was promised. The law is like a speedometer. Here's the thing. Like, I got a, I got a, a motorcycle that's a, like a bobber, like a suicide shift bobber. It's got no gauges on it or anything. And I, so I don't have a, a speedometer. And so I don't know how fast I'm going. I just try to go less fast than the person that's, that's you know, the, the, be the least fast person on the road. And the, rea- the problem with not having a speedometer is if this person's doing 105, then I think I'm cool, but I'm actually doing like 95. You know, I don't have 
a speedometer, the blue and red lights are, you know, maybe hit me behind me. And I'm like, sir, why didn't you pull the guy that was going faster? Because I couldn't catch him. I could catch you, you know? So, so they pull me over because I was speeding. But without a speedometer, it's hard to know that you're speeding. And so what the law did and the purpose of the law was that we know God requires perfection. He requires holiness. Now that holiness and righteousness is given to us in the person of Jesus. It's just a gift. I mean, it's like uh, God says, I, you got to be holy like I'm holy. And then he says, here's the righteousness of Christ. I mean, first off, like God says, you got to be righteous if we can have a relationship. The law said, well, we can never be righteous. So God said, here's Jesus. And he, 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 he now gives you the righteousness of Christ that you only know you couldn't measure up because of the law. And so the, the Jews had become really accustomed to these rituals that reminded them that they needed God. And I wondered this week, so, so this is, again, as a way of illustration, part of my message today is just musing with you, kind of brainstorming a bit about why, 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 how do we live more power-filled lives? And today, believe it or not, I actually am drawing a lesson from the religious people. I mean, just to be honest with you, I, I like when Paul goes off on religious people. Like, I like it. I'm like, yeah, give it to him, Paul. You know, because I like, I have a hard time like, like really connecting with people that are, you feel like are always just waiting on you to blow it. And, but today I learned a lesson from the, the religious people in the room. See, the church in, in Galatia, the Jews had a hard time understanding the triune God, that they knew God in one way, but they didn't understand the triune God. Why? Because Jesus wasn't given and the Holy Spirit wasn't given after Jesus left. And so they couldn't understand the triune God. Here's what they knew about God. So the early Jews, they would have been good Jewish boys and girls. They probably learned these Bible verses when they went to Sunday school in the temple. Verses like this, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult called for you. They would have learned Isaiah 40, 26, and they would have quoted this in Sunday school. And if they would have quoted it right, the, uh, the teacher would have thrown a thing of candy or gum. They would have known, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. There's been no Jesus who eats with sinners. There's been no Jesus who goes into the house of sinners. There is a God who is mighty and powerful. Like verse, verse uh, like this would have been, anybody do Bible drills? Anybody know what a Bible drill is? Am I the only person? Okay, a couple of us know Bible drills. A Bible drill is whenever that you like the, the the Sunday school teacher will give you a passage of scripture and everybody has a Bible. Those are back in the days. Now we have them on our phone. I just dated myself. But, but you got to, the first person to get there and stand up and read it got like a, a point. This was the least favorite book of the Bible for a Bible drill. Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3.4. It says this, so they went in the temple, these Jewish boys and girls did a Bible drill, and they came to this verse, his radiance is like the sunlight, he has rays flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. They would have known Psalm chapter 8, when I look at the night sky, and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. The, the Jews had an understanding of a powerful God. They had a fear of God that I struggled to know in the same way that they do. They, they were guys that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant that represents the, the presence of God. And when it started to fall, uh, someone reached out to, to just simply catch the Ark of the Covenant. And what, did anybody know what happened to him? Dead. Struck dead because you can't touch the Ark of the Covenant. There's a couple of people in the Bible, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they, they w w said they basically really truly paid their tithes, but they didn't pay all of it. And they lied to the, 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 the preacher and didn't pay all the tithes. They paid some of their tithes. Anybody know what happened to them? Dead. I'm going to start, I'm going to try that. It's going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to start, I'm going to start that next week. I'm going to be a new campaign. But <laughs> these guys that, that Paul's talking to, I mean, there is a genuine 
reverence for the power of God. And they don't want to risk not doing the things that constantly remind them that he is a powerful God. And what, what if they know themselves? What, and I, what, what if they know themselves? And they're like, if I, stop, if I stop building my diet around these things I've known to be true about God, what if, what if that means that I let go of other things and, and I stop honoring this God that is so powerful, so other than me? You're saying I just need to believe and I'm grateful for that. But what if belief has shortchanged us from really doing the work that honors the power that's been given us? And I'm not saying there's anything more to do than believe. I'm saying this, this is, this is if I had to boil my entire message down to a sentence, it's this sentence. It was hard for the early church to understand that they could possibly have a relationship with a God who was so powerful by simply believing. And for us, having to simply believe can keep us from comprehending the power that our relationship with God should bring to our lives. They were so scared of forfeiting these things that are keep the forefront or keep the power of God right in the front of their mind. And now the, now the, the game has changed. And they don't have to do those things. But let me just talk about me. This might not be your story at all. Let me just talk about me. I don't always live like I've got the power of God readily available to me. And the way I respond to my wife and, and the way I think and, and react in traffic and, and the way I go through storms and trials, I don't always live like I've got the power of God, the power revealed in the, the resurrection of Jesus. I don't always live like that, but I have access to it. And I wonder, I wonder if it's because most of the time I'm not living life in a way that keeps my heart in constant check of to be reverently in awe of God. There's a there's a there's a a word that if I say it it gives my wife PTSD in my house it's uh it's it's baby cover your ears uh, rafting if I say the word rafting in my house my wife gets instant PTSD that was the thing I loved to do in Ohio for a while and and um, it's like riding a motorcycle the, see I, when I got her on the back of a motorcycle after only a few rides. We wrecked it, and, and it banged her up really bad, way worse than me. And so she said, you know what? Riding motorcycles is going to be your thing, Dustin. And rafting was similar. Hey, babe, you should go rafting with me. Well, the first rafting trip was a torrential downpour. Back in Ohio, the weather can change like that. It was nice and sunny. And I'm talking torrential downpour, and we're stuck, and we have to just basically keep hammering down through it. And my wife said, that rafting needs to be your thing. And so she, my wife's a very gracious, very generous person. So I, next time I went, I said, baby, uh, can we try it again? That just wasn't a really good, a good time. And she, she said, yeah, baby, we had tried again because I'm gracious and I'm, I, I'm, I, I just love you. And so we did it again. Uh, I lost the oar um, while we were going. I hit a rock and it lost it. And I was moving downstream and I couldn't get back. And so we were just at the mercy of the current and then me getting out and dragging it. Um, so she said, Dustin, rafting is going to be your thing. Uh, so the third time, baby, will you go again? And she said, sure, baby. This is her own fault. The fact that she said it the third time, this is on her, Okay. So glutton for punishment. So, but I had I had upped the game a little bit, and so she's 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 good with it because I bought a trolling motor for the back of my raft. So I had a trolling motor on the back of my raft, and so now no one had to paddle. We don't got to worry about losing oars. We don't got to. So now just just we can just go and we'll get there, and no one's stressed out. And so we hit this one spot where there was rapids, and and the battery fell out that was <laughs> controlling. The trolling motor, and I'm not kidding you. So now I had a trolling motor, but I had no battery. And it started to rain, the real bad rain. And now we're going against the current with no battery and no oars because I thought I had a trolling motor. I thought of that story. Because and when the storms of life come into my life, I, it's, like, it's like I've got Jesus and I accept that I got Jesus, and he's or the spirit of God. I got God's spirit, and God's spirit is like this trolling motor. He's gonna, he, he wants to get me through this thing, but I have no power because I haven't really recognized that God is wanting to not just 
give me his spirit, but wants to align my life to the things of God so that the spirit of God, when made the first thing in my life, actually gives me the kind of power to navigate through these things. But maybe maybe you're like me to where like you, you, you hit a, a rapid and you're scared to death. You hit, you hit some kind of bad day at work or some fight in your home or some financial deal. And it's literally like abandoned ship. But I, I want to learn about a God that stands above the waves in my life. Stand above, to know about a God that actually gives me power to get through, the, that, if I don't have a battery, if I don't have a power source, I'm never going to be able to navigate those things. Jesus, he does, he, he does two things. There's one that we know about. Like we, we sing about this, we preach about this. This is where I camp out a lot when I'm preaching. We know this, these two things. Jesus gets us to God. We know that. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. He, he stands, and when, when, when we've done these bad things, Jesus says, yes, but I did the final thing. I went to the cross. I paid the debt. And so Jesus does get us to God. Here's, I'm going to breeze through these verses. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In John 10, chapter 6, verse 7, those who heard Jesus use this illustration understand, did not understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I'm the gate for the sheep. Jesus is reiterating over and over again. You want to get to God, you go through me. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. John chapter 12, verse 44, Jesus shouted to the crowds, if you trust me, you're trusting trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you're seeing the one who sent me. Like Jesus is the way that we get to God. It's how the wrath of God is completely uh, diminished. It's placated because of what Jesus Christ did. Jesus gets us to God. And so we can relate to God, to God through the person of Jesus and have access to God. But the message for today is not that Jesus gets us to God. It's that Jesus is God. And in and, and John chapter 10, verse 30, the Father and I are one. John chapter 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Remember, he is the visible reality of an invisible God. Verse 17 or verse 21 of John 17, Jesus is praying and he says, I pray, Father, that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. I like this in the Amplified Version, so I threw this up there. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word who was Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. All things were made and came into existence through him, and without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. Like the ark that we sh showed the picture of. Here's, here's John going all the way back to the story of creation and, and reminding us that Jesus was there at the story of creation. And a way that I know I've got power in my li life is if I'm connected to God, my life is going to demonstrate power. But what does power look like? What is getting to God Having that power look like, well, let's go back, like John said, to the very story of creation. Then God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, as the band, come on up here if you don't mind. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. Here we see it again, Jesus, there at the time of creation. Let us make human beings in our image. What is, let's, let's read those four words together. I'll read the first part and let's jump in together. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. To be like us. So how do we know if this thing is getting set straight? If we're, do, do our lives look like God? You're like, you're like, how do I know my life looks like God? Well, that's why he sent Jesus who is God, who set things straight. And so as we look at scripture, and this is like, I know you're, you're like, this seems like a very idealistic question, but I'm learning. I actually have the ability to discipline my life to where I can make the kinds of choices that I'm more and more and more like Jesus every single day. I blow it. Oh man, I blow it constantly. 
But that's why that the grace of Jesus that is extended to me at the cross meets me when I blow it. But I'm learning actually to look at the Jews and to see the reverence that they had for the things of God that I don't always have because it's just this free gift. He's a friend of sinners. He, he leaves the 99 to get to the one. But what about my life day in and day out? Does it look like Jesus? Because if it looks like Jesus, I'm going back to the original design that God established with Jesus when he was in the garden. Now he gave Jesus so that we could get back to what he always wanted us to be, and that was be to be like him. That was a lot to say. But is my life and is your life looking like Jesus? The story of the gospel and the story of the whole Bible is heaven being bankrupted so that our lives could look different than what we're naturally wired to make them look like. And my life constantly just looks like, if I'm not careful, it looks like what I want what I think, what I'm interested in, what my ambitions are. And the more I understand about Scripture, the more I understand about the, the, the links that God went to get to me, the more I realize that my life is always intended in the original design before the virus of sin came was just to be like God. And then he sent Jesus to help me know what does it look like to be like God. And, and this one thread that runs throughout the Bible I had so much fun putting this together. Can we stand up together? The Bible can be broken down into three words. What are those? Let's say it together. The Bible can be broken down into three words. What are those? In Genesis, he was the cre creator and promised redeemer. In Exodus, he was the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he was the high priest. In Numbers, he was water in the desert. In Deuteronomy, he, became, he becomes the curse for us. In Joshua, he's the commander of the army of the Lord. These are all foreshadows of the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus that would be given to us later on. We'd, we'd read about it in the Gospels. One of the names he's given is Emmanuel, which means... And these are foreshadows from the Old Testament, and then we'll get to the New Testament. And, and Joshua, he's the commander of the army of the Lord, and judges, he delivers us from injustice. And Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. And First Samuel, he's all in one. He is the prophet, priest, and king. And Second Samuel, he's the king of grace and love. And First Kings, he's a ruler greater than Solomon. In Second Kings, he's the powerful prophet. And First Chronicles, he's the son of David that is coming to rule. In 2 Chronicles, he's the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, he's the priest proclaiming freedom. In Nehemiah, he's the one who restores what is broken down. In Esther, he's the protector of the people. In Job, he's the mediator between God and man. In Psalms, he's our song in the morning and the night. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning for life. In Song of Solomon, he's our author of faithful love. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant. In Jeremiah, he's the weeping Messiah. In Lamentations, he assumes God's wrath for us. In Ezekiel, he's the son of man. In Daniel, he's the stranger in the fire with us. God just, the Spirit of God just said, that's for somebody. In Daniel, I want to read it again. In Daniel, we read that the foreshadow of Jesus is the stranger in the fire with us, what we are going through, what you are going through. There is one whose name is Jesus who is there with you. And Hosea, he's the faithful husband, even when we run away. And Joel, he's sending his spirit to his people. And Amos, he delivers justice to the oppressed. And Obadiah, he's the judge of those who do evil. And Jonah, he's the greatest missionary. And Micah, he casts our sin into the forgetfulness sea. Any ameners there? Nahum, he proclaims future world peace that we cannot even imagine. In Habakkuk, the worst book for a, a sword drill, he crushes injustice. In Zephaniah, he's the warrior who saves. In Haggai, he restores our worship. Thank you, Jesus. In Zechariah, he's a, he prophesies a Messiah who is pierced for us. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness who brings healing. 
And then the gospel came, the New Testament is given to us. And in Matthew, he's the Messiah who is king. In Mark, he's the Messiah who is a servant. In Luke, he's the Messiah who was a deliverer. In John, he's the Messiah who is a God in the flesh. In Acts, he's the spirit who dwells in his people. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he's the power and love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he's the down payment of what's to come. How many know he's coming again? How many know he's coming again to finish what he started? Celebrate that. In Galatians, he's our very life. In Ephesians, he's the unity of the church. In Philippians, he's the joy of our life. In Colossians, he holds the supreme position in all things. In 1 Thessalonians, he's our comfort in the last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he's our returning king. In 1 Timothy, he's savior of the worst sinners. In 2 Timothy, he's the leader of of leaders. In Titus, he's the foundation of truth. In Philemon, he's our mediator. In Hebrews, he's our high priest. In James, he matures our faith. In 1 Peter, he's our hope in times of suffering. In 2 Peter, he's the one who guards us from false teaching. In 1 John, he's the source of all fellowship. In 2 John, he's the God in the flesh. In 3 John, he's the source of all truth. In Jude, he protects us from stumbling. And in Revelation, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning in the end, the one who one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is king to the glory of God the Father. That's the Jesus that we've been given to know the heart of God for our lives. We have access to that. We need to live power-filled lives in response to that. The song I asked the band to sing, I love the kinds of songs where when you don't know how to close a service and you want to give people a chance to sort of respond to the word of God, you get these songs that make these declarations. And the, the declaration here is, I believe. The course starts with, I believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe the Holy Spirit. Three in one. And when we say, I believe, did you know this can be a prayer? More than a melody, more than just a song, this can be a prayer that steps into the understanding. I believe that your word is true. I believe that there's power that is available to me. I want to take that power out of the closet of my life. I want to get it into the, the life blood of my life, into my thoughts, into my emotions, into my actions. And so we sing songs like I believe. And this could be a stepping into I want a life that lives like I have access to some power. Somebody here is going to maybe go, I'm sick of living a powerless life. I don't know about you. I am sick of living a powerless life, especially when I've been given access to the very power that raised Christ from the dead. Can we just tell Jesus, thank you for what he gave to us. Let's sing.